together. Oh, come on. Isn't God good? I don't know about you, but uh, courage, that take courage, man. And I want to thank you for you sharing your angelic heavenly voice with us. Somebody say amen. just want to share a few things with you in way of our sermonic text for this morning. I imagine the snow has kept some in their homes. Somebody say amen. But you have braved the weather. Uh, and so for those of you who are watching us online because you couldn't brave it with us, uh, our hearts and our minds are with you uh, as you uh, gather around with your family to watch. But we are here. And so because we are here, we'll stand in honor of the reading of the word of the Lord. And I want to read from Ephesians, the second chapter. Ephesians, the second chapter, starting with verse 1. If you're able, stand with us. And we're going to read Ephesians, the second chapter, starting with verse 1 together. Ephesians 2, starting with verse 1. Are we there? The Bible says, And you he made alive, who what? Who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Verse 4, but God, who is rich in his mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By his grace, you have been saved. And I don't think I have it on the screen. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ that in all the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8 says, For grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. I want to talk to you from the subject, but God. But God. Father in heaven, we thank you for the assurances of your word. As we open, God, your word to hear what it is you have to say to us, we ask that you speak to us as never before. Hide me behind the cross, Lord, so that your son will be edified and glorified. In the most precious name of Jesus, I pray. Let everyone say amen. 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 You may be seated in the presence of God. In the book Healing for Damaged Emotions, David Seedmans tells a story about a merchant who went one day to the market to sell quail. What was so striking about these quail was that they were not in a cage. Everyone knew that quail were made and born to be wild and roam free, but the onlookers uh, noticed that despite not being locked up, they would all these quail would do would walk would they would walk around in a circle. One of the customers asked the farmer why it was that his quail did not fly away. It was a phenomenon that was striking to see. 
The farmer told the customer that every day since they were born, the farmer would tie a string to the left leg of each quail, and the other end of the string he would tie to a stake that he placed in the middle of the ground. Therefore, as the quail would make progress, they had, no, they had to make progress by merely walking in a circle. They continued to walk around and around. That was the only way they could move forward. After all, the string which was attached to their respective legs was also tied to a stake in the middle, causing them to merely walk around and around in a circle. Where they were was exactly where they were going. Where they started was exactly where they would end up. Ironically, no one was interested in purchasing the quail. They were entertained by them, but nobody wanted to purchase them. It just so happened that there was a man uh, walking by that took pity on these quail and decided that he was going to buy them. He paid the merchant the asking price, and then he did something that was very striking and almost unordinary. He told the merchant that he just paid for the quail and that because he bought them, he wanted them to now be set free. The farmer couldn't believe his ears. After all, who would pay such a high price for something and then just go and set them free? The farmer couldn't believe what he heard. But because they now belong to the man, the farmer did as the man instructed and he set the quail free. And you know what happened, don't you? The farmer, uh, the farmer uh, belied him because they no longer belonged to him. And he set them free. But instead of the quail running free in the direction that they were divinely destined and determined to go, they continued to walk around in the same circle. They were free. The, the, the string was not on their legs. There was nothing binding them to the ground, but they were captives of a cycle and a habit and a custom that had robbed them of their God-given ability to fly and be free. The man who bought the quail was upset and he was insulted and he wondered to himself, why in the world are they just walking around and around as if they are enslaved? I don't want them to be enslaved. I, I want them to be free. And he tried to shoo them. And the more he tried to shoo them, they would fly a few feet and then land and then find their place in the same circle. And guess what? They would sit in the circle. And even though they were set free, they would continue to go around and around and around. Even though they were free, they were conditioned that they would find their way back into the very thing that they were delivered from. They were so messed up and conditioned that no matter how many times they were shooed or scattered, they would always return to the same old habits and same patterns that had defined their existence. Don't you know that for some of us, God has set us free? And for some of us, we are so content with walking in circles year after year after year. Each and every year we make resolutions and we promise God that we're going to do, do better. We say to ourselves, uh, I won't be doing that anymore. I'm going to put that away finally. I'm no longer going to go there. This year, I'm going to read my Bible and pray every day. This year, I'm going to get out of debt. This year, maybe I'm going to lose some weight. This year, I'm finally going to walk away. And each year, year after year, we've turned the proverbial page into the next year, and we find ourselves just merely walking around in circles. I don't want to keep us too long because we have to go into communion, but as I was sitting down and, and, and writing this message, I began to get an overwhelming sense of God's grace. So much so that as I replayed the many scenes of my life, some scary and some scandalous and some shocking, I, I began to realize that I am where I am, and I got what I got. And I know what I know, and I am who I am, not because I am so brilliant, or not because I am so privileged, or so ordinary, or so handsome. And maybe if you all don't think of me as handsome, but at least Denise does. 
But I am who I am. Maybe. Do you, you babies? Okay. But I, stop disturbing me. But I am who I am for one reason and one reason alone, the grace of God. I dare anyone in here under the sound of my voice to one day sit and take inventory of your life and then come to the conclusion or determination that you would have been better off without God on your side. And I guarantee you that as you take introspection of your life, you would realize that if it had not been for God's hand on you, you would be in a messed up situation. Is there anyone in here that realizes that if God didn't keep his hand on you, you you're crazy now, but imagine if God didn't have his hand on you. You don't got all the money now, but imagine if God took his blessings from you. Anybody can agree that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I may not have everything, but if it wouldn't be for God, I would have nothing. And I know some of you may be saying, okay, pastor, that's you, but I've had it rough. Life for me ain't, ain't been a, a crystal stare, but have you ever thought about what life would be like without God, without Christ, without his grace, without his mercy, without his staying power, without his forgiveness, without his love? I think perhaps some of us, we need to take time to thank God and give God the praise and, and, and worship him and bow down before him, you know, forgetting us the job that we weren't qualified for, forgetting us the house that and we had no money in the bank, forgiving us that husband or that wife that loves us in spite of ourselves, forgiving us another chance when we've messed up, for not exposing us to as the frauds and the phonies and the fakes that we are. We ought to thank God for his grace. We ought to thank God that I'm at least in my right mind. That I may not have everything, but at least I have food on the table and clothes on my back. If we were to go with the Apostle Paul, the humble tent maker from Tarshish to the book of Ephesians, we would see Paul similarly taking inventory of his life. The Bible says, notice verse 1. Let's go quickly. Let's exegetically, exeg exegetically unpack this text and then go on. Verse 1 says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. Notice the first, first part of the text. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin. Were dead. Were dead. Uh, before conversion, man lives a life of death. We understand that, right? Note the words, you were dead. It is only until you meet Jesus and are born again that you're really alive. I'm going to repeat that. It's only until you meet Jesus and are born again that you really in your spirit become alive. Now how then can a man be living and dead at the same time? That's an oxymoron if I've ever heard one. Being dead and yet still alive. To understand that question, we have to understand what the word death really means. What does the word in the text death mean? Not, not to be alive, to, to be gone from here, to be out, to be absent from the body. Okay, but the word death here in this text means a little bit more than what we associate, death, uh, we associate with the word death. You can't see it by looking at the English morphology, but the word death is actually a bit deeper than the word we would commonly believe it to be because the basic meaning of the word death comes from the Greek word nekros, nekros. The word in the Greek nekros does not mean death, meaning you die and fall asleep. Nekros means separation. Death, as far as the Bible is concerned, never means extension, extinction, or annihilation, or non-existence, or inactivity. Death means simply that a person is either separated from his body in a physical sense, or from God in a spiritual sense. Now pay attention, and don't tune me out here now, Adventists, because I'm starting to talk about death. All right? Don't tune me out. I love what H.S. Miller says. He says, death is the separation of a person from the purpose or use for which he was intended. Mercy. Death is the separation of a person from the purpose or use for which he was intended. Based on that definition, some of us are dead. Okay, I see some of you all looking at me with bewilderment. 
Let me, let me see if I can make this simpler. When you are separated from your purpose, you are dead. Because some of us are not living up to our purpose and potential and promise for which we were created uh, uh, or what we were created and intended to do, we are dead. Why? Because some of us are dead or separated from our purpose. And when a purpose person is not in purpose, they are dead. I don't care how beautiful you are, how much pulchritude you have. I don't care how, how, how wonderful you are. I don't care how much money you have. If you are outside of your purpose, you are dead. That's why some of us can't stand to go to that job. <laughs> You're not in your purpose. Punching the, punching the clock was not what you were intended to do. You were created to do something more. Uh, some of us, we weren't created to work for someone else. That's why you don't like going to the job. Some of us, we, we weren't made to do the things that we're doing. God called us and made us and fashioned us and formed us to do something different. And because we're not doing it, we don't feel really alive. We are dead. Some of us are dead because we aren't living in purpose. So the Bible says uh, you were dead. You were dead. The, the, the text goes on to say, just going to unpack the text. And, you, and he made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So trespasses, the Greek word is uh, partonoma, means to fall or to slip or to blunder or to deviate, turn aside or wander away. It is a person who falls away from doing right. Slips from doing what he should, blunders and fails, deviates off the road and turns aside from what is right. Basically, the Bible is saying somebody who's really jacked up, if I could, uh, if I could concretize it in the Defoe version for you. So based on that definition, has anyone in here ever trespassed? It, okay, has anyone in here ever messed up? Has anyone in here ever gone right when they should have gone left? Nobody? Nobody in here ever did something wrong. All right. Well, maybe you all won't admit it. But I know I have made some mistakes. I've made some big mistakes. I've slipped up over and over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, I slip up so many times, it's easy for me to preach grace because I'm a regular recipient of God's grace. Maybe that's not you. Maybe that's not you. I want you to understand what Paul is saying. To be dead means you are separated from Christ. To trespass is to make a mistake. You were dead in your sins. Okay, look at verse 2. And you were made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Okay, that was a lot. Let me hang it where you can reach it. Notice the past tense language of the apostle Paul. You were dead. You formerly walked. This was the season of your life, according to verse 2, where the devil, referred to in this text as the prince of the power of the air, told you what to do. In other words, this was a period of your life where the devil ran, where the devil ran you. The devil had you wrapped around his finger. The devil uh, maybe even had you whipped on some things. Uh, uh, if, we, if you can let me be transparent for one second. I can remember a season in my life where the devil was running me, where truthfully, no matter what it is that I decided to do, we talked about it in Unpacked Romans 7 this morning, and we talked about the fact that uh, Paul wrestled with this dichotomy in his spirit between his flesh and his spirit where he wanted to do right, but there was something in him that was always calling and pulling and yearning for him to do wrong. But I don't know, I, 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 I know most of us don't want to admit this, but uh, 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 the devil is running you when you want to stop doing stuff and you can't stop. The devil is running you be, 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 when you want to get out of the relationship, but the late night phone call always pulls you back in. The devil is running you when, 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 when you go to the store and you know you don't even have money to pay the bills, but you'll continue to shop on a credit card. The, the devil is running you. I don't know if you can look back and see some habit that 
you had and maybe say silly of me for letting that control me and take my money away or take my life away or destroy my marriage. The truth of the matter is some of us, we don't like to admit that we are dead. We're living outside of our purpose. Anyone ever seen, um, I, I, it's always trouble when I get off my notes. Anyone ever seen that movie, uh, The Sixth Sense? Where, come on, y'all shouldn't be watching movies. Y'all having this, do better. <laughs> All right, if you ever seen that movie, the, six, the little boy is talking to this guy, and all of us, all, all movie long, you're thinking that this guy is alive. And the little boy is always is saying to him, you know, I see dead people. And apparently the whole movie, he was talking to a dead guy. But the guy never knew that he was dead. That's some of us. Some of us think we're walking around alive. We're walking around in purpose that we're walking around having been saved and having been born again. But we have not yet entered into the purpose for which God has called us and we're dead. Verse 3. Let me go. Look, hurry up. All right. Verse 3. Hurry up, David. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So we are all we're jacked up like everyone else. You and I, if, if, if we're dead, if we're, not doing, if we're not living right, if we're not living in the way God called us to live, we're jacked up just like everybody else. That's why I really don't understand why as, a, as church folk we compare sins. I don't understand why it's so difficult for church people to, 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 be, to, 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 to not accept the fact that there are some people that are just tempted differently than you are. But the truth of the matter is we all end up in the same place if we don't overcome it. Yeah, maybe God tempts some people with homosexuality and God tempts someone else with, 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 with promiscuity, but maybe God will just tempt you with pride. Or maybe God will just tempt you with, you know, that judging spirit that you have that looks down on other people. And I guarantee you that if you don't confess that, we'll be in the same place. Whatever, okay. All right. Paul says you were formal, you were nasty. You were sinful, you were dirty, you were a trip, you were messed up, you were tore up from the floor up. What else can I say? You, 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 you did drugs, you, 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 you were in places where you shouldn't have been, you were sleeping with people you weren't married to, you, you were abusive, you were destructive, you were dirty, you were nasty, you were all of these things, but notice what verse 4 says. Verse 4 says you were jacked up, you messed up, you're trash juice. Verse 4 says, but God... How did that come out of my mouth? But God, verse 4, stop, you all are silly, stop it. Come on, I said I was going to be mature in the new year. Verse 4, but God, who is, yeah, God can help. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved, but God, here it is. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together. We, come on, that should make somebody excited. The Bible says even when we were dead, because of his great love. His so when did this process of being alive start? Somebody answer. Well, when did this process start? Take a look at verse 5. What does verse 5 tell us? Um, the Bible says this process of being alive was started what? Even when? Huh? Even when we, when I was dead. It means even when I was messing up, he had his eye on me. Even when I was tripping out, I was on God's radar. Even when I was doing things that I shouldn't do, he was looking out for me. Even though I was doing the wrong thing, he was watching out for me. And he was ordering my steps. And he had his angels watching over me. He built a hedge around me even when I was doing dumb. And I'm so glad that even while yet we were sinners, Christ died for us. I'm excited at the fact that even when I was dirty, Christ died for me. That even when I was messing up, Christ died died for me when I was dead. He died for me. So what does the Bible mean when the text says <laughs> that he made us? Uh, okay. Uh, even when we were dead our trespasses together and he raised us together and made us. Made us. I, I, I thought we were born with choice. How can God make you and I do anything. 
We're born with choice. What the text implies is that God has the habit of closing some doors in your life to make you go in the direction that he desires you to go in. Okay, let me give you the remix. God has the habit of making things pop off in your life in order to steer you and maneuver you off the course you're going in to the direction he wants you to go in. Meaning he can steer you from death into purpose. What that means is you shouldn't be sad all of the time when certain things bad happen in your life. When you get fired from that one job, that may be God's way of making you move in the direction of purpose. When she walked away from you, that may have been God's way of steering you away from that ragamuffin to give you something that was going to be good for you. I'm going to stop right here and, 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 and thank God for new directions and new paths. And, and I don't know if you could be a witness, but I'm a witness to the fact that sometimes you can get all sick, sad, and sorry that God is doing something that you don't understand. And when you go back and you look on it and you say, oh man, that must have been the hand of God. Because where I was going, that would surely be to the, the road to death. But praise God that he maneuvered and he steered and he redirected some things so that I can be in purpose. I'm a witness that sometimes God can make us because if I had my choice I may be in jail where some of my friends are that I grew up with we made the same exact choices and how is it that I'm here and they're there y'all don't I thank God that he has a way of orchestrating things I thank God that he's in the changing business, that, 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 that he has a way of making a way where we don't even understand what he's doing. All right, I got to go. Come on, come on. You all go. Come on, come on. So I can go. My time is up. So if you're going through something right now, I encourage you to hold on. Because perhaps God is closing some doors in your face and shutting windows of opportunity on you because he's making a new plan for you. We may not understand what it is we're going through, but if what we're going through will be for his glory, what we're going through will eventually be for our good. You can't see it now, but he's making a way for you. So the Bible says, he made us alive together with Christ. I was a trip. I was messed up. I had proclivities. I had propensities toward evil. But God. I like that. Now, some of you all don't know, I was an English major in college, waste of a degree. Um, but the word but is a conjunction. As a matter of fact, it's an adversative conjunction. You all ever seen that conjunction, junction, what's the? Okay, you all have seen it too, all right. A conjunction means something has just stopped, but something else is about to happen. <laughs> he says, you were dead. You were hopeless. You were messed up. You were unlovable. You were no good. All of that happened, but something else is about to happen. God. What a great word, but God. You were dead, but God. You were messed up, but God. Come on, try it. Somebody say this. Somebody repeat after me, but God. Come on, someone say it. Come on, say it again, but God. but God. Come on, say it again. Say it like you mean it. Come on, say it like you really mean it. I should have been dead. I should have been strung out. I should be crazy. I used to be nasty. Could have lost my mind. Could have lost my job. Should have more kids than what I got. Should have been caught. Should have been in jail should be broke, should be unemployed, should be divorced, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. It's by grace that you have been saved. 
It's by God's grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace that we've been restored. Grace that we have been reestablished. It's by grace that we've been given another chance. Take a look at what the Bible says. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. You know, when God, when Christ came to this earth, he came to this earth to die for each and every one of us. To give us access to the grace and goodness of God. I don't know about you, but when I think about what Christ has done for me, how he took me from where he found me and loved me even in spite of myself, and it brought me to where I am now, I can only look back on it and be grateful for his grace. And as we come to this table and prepare for this supper, the truth of the matter is we have an opportunity to experience the mercy and riches of God new, just like the brand newness of a new year. The hymn writer says, alas, and did my savior bleed and did my sovereign die? Would he devote his sacred head for such a one as I. Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. On Calvary's hill of sorrow, where sin's demands were paid, and rays of hope for tomorrow across our paths were laid. Today no condemnation abides to turn away my soul from his salvation. He's in my heart to stay. And when we reach that portal where life forever reigns, the ransom's host grand finale will be this glad refrain. I see a crimson stream of blood. It flows from Calvary. Its waves which reach the throne of God are sweeping over me. Someone asked the question, what can wash away my sins? Someone else replied, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing, nothing, not money, nothing, not position, nothing, not a job, nothing, not title, nothing, not even death, nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. In this new year, I want to see us new life. I no longer want to see us living beneath our potential. I want to see each and every one of us living the purpose for which we were intended to live. And I don't know about you, but I know that because his mercies are not only new every morning, but the new year is here upon us. I'm not going to enter into the next year, not even to the next day, the same that I am now. I'm going to make a commitment in my heart today that no matter what it is that I need to do, I need to accept the free gift of God's grace for the remission of my sins. And be grateful that even when I was dead, Christ saved me. Christ loved me. Father in heaven, we thank you for the assurances of your word. Where will we be, God, if it were not for your love? Father, we thank you that even when we were dead, even in our trespasses, even in our mess, even in our foolishness, God, even in our mistakes, Father, you still loved us. Father, we're grateful that you're in the habit and in the business of orchestrating new avenues in our lives, Father. And for someone, Lord, maybe they're going through some pain and they don't understand what you're doing, God. Maybe someone today, under the sound of my voice, they're suffering, Father, and they don't get it, Father. But Lord, help us to understand that if we hold on, eventually we'll see that it was for your glory, God. And we know because you love us, if it's for your glory, it will be for our good. So we thank you, God. We bless you. We honor you, Lord. And then, Lord, perhaps maybe there's someone today that knows they need to get right with you. 
There's someone, God, that maybe has art with their brother or sister. There's somebody here, God, that has not been doing the things that they ought to be doing, Lord, and they need to make an apology to someone else, God, as we break off into the ordinance of humility, Father. We pray that it's not mechanical, God. Don't just direct us to wash one another's feet that we know that we're comfortable with, God. But perhaps, Lord, there's somebody we need to ask forgiveness from. There's somebody, Lord God, that maybe we need to bury the hatchet with. Oh, God, don't let this day pass without us making amends. Without us saying we're sorry. Without us greeting one another with a, with a holy kiss and a holy hug. Because, Father, how could we expect you to forgive us and we won't forgive our brother or our sister? So we pray for everyone now under the sound of my voice. As we enter into this, your supper, Father, we pray that whatever it is that is in us that is unlike you, Father, you remove it, God. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and all the glory. In the most precious name of Jesus, I pray. Let everyone say amen. God bless you. God bless you.